welcome back to the Earth Day 50 virtual kickoff. My name is Jairo Munoz, and I am one of the communications organizers with March for Science NYC. My day job is actually that of a neuroscientist studying decision making and emotional regulation in monkeys, which gives us insight into things like mood and mental health disorders. A perfect segue into our next segment. In a crisis, how does our brain respond? How can we cope? Dr. Britt Ray is here, who is a science communicator extraordinaire and is going to start us off by talking about the connection between the climate crisis and our mental health. Her current research focuses on eco-anxiety and methods that can be used to navigate the trauma behind climate change. After that, a member of our programming committee, Dr. Carla Golden, will lead us in a Q&A. If you have any questions that you'd like Dr. Ray to answer, please direct them to the WOVA app. And now, Dr. Britt Ray. Hi everyone, thank you so much. I'm Britt and I'm writing a book right now about the mental health impacts of the climate crisis because the climate crisis has become the greatest threat to mental health that humanity has ever known. So today I want to explain why that is and suggest some ideas for what we can do about that in five points. Firstly, most people who associate mental health with climate change will probably think about the traumatic episode of a fast moving disaster like a wildfire or a hurricane and with good reason. There is a strong body of evidence to show that when those kinds of disasters strike, we see spikes in increased PTSD, suicidality, depression, substance abuse, domestic abuse, all sorts of things. After Hurricane Katrina, for example, suicide attempts went up 79 times higher in areas that were affected by the hurricane compared to their normal baseline rates which can be explained by the domino effects of displacement, unstable housing, financial insecurity, and the general loss of support that follows a disaster. And those living at the fringes of society, like mentally ill people, in these scenarios just become more vulnerable. In heat waves, for example, which are becoming more frequent and are the deadliest of disasters, antipsychotic medicines can just stop working altogether. And multiple studies show that at higher temperatures, we become more violent to each other and to ourselves. On unusually hot days, suicide rates go up as well as hospitalizations for self-harm. And in the US, areas that are hotter tend to have more violent crime than areas that are cooler. Okay, so secondly, the mental health impacts of slow creeping climate events can be just as damaging as the fast ones. One study found that climate change contributed to the suicides of nearly 60,000 Indian farmers over the last three decades as the creep of rising temperatures damaged their crops. Now, the mechanism of this is not acute, but rather this gradual, slow loss of hope for the future. That feeling of waking up every morning and saying, is it going to rain today? Is it not going to rain today? Am I ever going to be able to harvest enough crop this season to pay back my debts? All of that can become far too much for people to bear. Worsening droughts also increase migration. The UN forecasts that roughly 200 million and possibly up to a billion people will be migrating within their own nations and across borders by 2050 because of climate change. And migrants may face extreme discrimination, civil strife, and women, when they're migrating, often find themselves living under the threat of sexual violence, which increases the risks for anxiety, depression, and suicide. Women, indigenous people, racialized minorities, seniors, low-income people, all of these people already face huge inequality in health as it is, and that same pattern applies for their mental health in times of crisis. Another key example is the Inuit people in the circumpolar north who face existential distress as they witness the ice, which is a vital part of their identity, just vanishing before their very eyes. Because now the ice is solid for far fewer months of the years that, they, that it used to be, and that affects when people can go out hunting, fishing, traipsing where their ancestors have for thousands of years and gathering wood to heat their homes. When they can't do that, it's spiritually diminishing. And people speak about a tremendous fear and helplessness and hopelessness and rage of all of this happening on top of knowing that they had nothing to do with creating this crisis. And of course, that's on top of centuries of colonization. This has created a sense of soul nostalgia, which is the feeling of being homesick when you're still at home because your home has changed so much that it's no longer what it was. Okay, thirdly, climate events eat away at our economies, which affects our mental health. So when a resource dwindles, whether that's farmable land or fishable stocks, the jobs that rely on those resources go away. And then the people in those communities who have the most money, education, and social supports, they move away to find other prospects elsewhere, leaving behind a group of less resilient people. 
And all that means is that you end up getting the most vulnerable people clustering together in the most vulnerable places. And over time, they're the most likely to be in the path of disaster and the least able to rebuild when it strikes. Fourthly, it's no secret that people everywhere are feeling overwhelmed by what the artists at the Bureau of Linguistic Reality have called broken record record breaking. You know, that endless barrage of news that says that environmental prospects are continuously worse than we had thought. And eco-anxiety, which is defined as the chronic fear of environmental doom is also rising. Many people have stories of waking up to realizing how bad our environmental situation is, which then sends them on a grief-stricken path of mourning futures that they believe they were gonna have, but now feel that they aren't going to have. Children and young people are particularly vulnerable. And in response, a group of climate-aware psychologists and psychiatrists have been growing. And they help people, not by pathologizing this pain and trying to treat and dismiss this pain, but on the contrary, they legitimize it and point out its appropriateness based on what's happening. And then they help people use their feelings, use that grief in order to find meaning in their own lives and empowering actions that they can take. And if you're interested, you should check out the Climate Psychology Alliance. Lastly, to inform this book that I'm writing, I've been speaking to hundreds of experts all over the world, asking them, what can we do to design for greater emotional resilience in our climate change era? And time and time again, the same answer emerges. It's that we need to design for greater social connectedness in our communities. The potential of social relationships to allow residents in a community to coordinate their efforts and achieve shared goals is what's known as social capital. And research shows that building up our social capital now is the number one thing we can do to protect and care for our mental health. One study, for example, looked at post-traumatic stress disorder in children who had survived a category five cyclone in Australia. And they found that the top 10% of the most socially connected kids, meaning the kids that had the most other children to trust and play with and talk to in their life, had significantly lower PTSD than all their peers, whereas those on the bottom 10% of the least socially connected, the most isolated kids had significantly worse PTSD. Social connectedness increases um, our sense that we are not abandoned, that we are not alone. And then our social connectedness, our ties in our community physically allow us to actually rebuild. And these things work together to weave the fabric of our resilience, our ability to actually bounce back after adversity. And when we're feeling eco-anxious, we process those emotions best when we are in non-judgmental spaces with others, where we're actually given explicit permission to feel these heavy emotions. But our society at large has still not yet normalized this grief, nor the value that it carries to really transform how we all show up in the world and what we can do. But imagine how much meaning would be unleashed in our communities if we did normalize that pain. Growing our emotional intelligence for the climate change era needs to be a priority, and it will fuel the actions that can help us. So to conclude, the climate crisis has lit the global mental health agenda on fire. Climate disasters exacerbate mental health problems, and if you multiply, perhaps exponentially, the proportion of humanity that's going to be experiencing that kind of thing, that in and of itself is a terrifying prospect we're not ready for, but then add to that the chronic background of worrying about that happening, and then experiencing disruptions in food and water markets, economic insecurity, migration, and the sense that things are still getting harder while we are striving to decarbonize, and then you'll see that you can't find another moment in human history when our mental health has been so all-encompassingly threatened. So the time to fiercely protect and care for our mental health is right now. The mental health field must innovate way beyond the current biomedical model that we have to meet this challenge. It can't only, lie, it can't only rely on a therapist or in hospitals because we simply don't have enough of them and they're too expensive. So mental health innovation right now means social innovation and social innovation means climate innovation. We can and must solve for multiple problems at once. So let's focus on strengthening our community ties now and enjoying all the fruits that that is going to bear in our lives, which includes, but goes way beyond averting disaster. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Thank you, Dr. A, for talking to us about how the climate crisis affects mental health. And thank you for giving voice to the struggles that many people face during this time. I'm Carla Bolden. I'm a postdoctoral fellow studying the neuroscience of decision making at NYU, and I'm on the programming committee for March for Science NYC. Hi. The first question we have for you is can you support or can you talk more about how we can balance both taking measures that support our own resiliency and mental health, like having kids, which I know is something you've talked about in the past, yeah. and also increase your carbon emissions on the order of thousands of tons? 
with wanting to have a positive impact on the environment. So we know that anything that disrupts our social connections is a huge threat to our mental health, and that's with or without climate change. So the things that can really impact the way that we come together and fight climate change and work on solutions are community initiatives. We know that this is a collective problem. So finding neighborhood groups, climate activism groups, whatever it might be that you are called to do to put pressure on your elected officials and actually follow through on some solutions that we need. Not only does that you know, have these beneficial impacts that we need with lowering our emissions and addressing the problem, but they increase your social connectedness and capital with other people, which helps make you feel more emotionally grounded and more resilient just in terms of having people to rely on when the going gets tough. So these things, what's so cool about them is that they multiply on top of each other. They make you more emotionally resilient. They affect the climate impacts that we need. And then hopefully, you know, you mentioned having children. This is an incredibly, um, personal decision, which is becoming more and more explicitly tied to the climate crisis as people fear bringing children into this world given the ecological health diminishing prospects that we see. But when you find communities that you can process those emotions with, you can be more resilient in making that decision, not from a place of fear, but from a place of deep groundedness. And one thing I'll mention is to check out the Good Grief Network as a place to process these emotions. They have online gatherings. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question from the audience is how are natural disasters linked to mental health in the long term, such as intergenerational trauma? Oh, yeah, big, huge. So I mentioned the Inuit people in Labrador, Canada, for example, who are feeling this existential dread as this piece of their identity is literally melting away. And what makes it so much more pernicious is not just the loss of, um, you know, being able to work with it's, certain animal migration patterns that they understand or how to pick berries at certain moments or when to go out on the ice. It's, that it's happening on top of generational trauma that's pre-existing and has not seen any reparation. And so that is transmitted further down the line and just kind of a downward spiral of in increased injustice and inequality. And this will happen and is happening in so many frontline communities and why climate justice needs to be the way that we approach these problems to offer reparations and to get communities what they need in order to move towards a more virtuous cycle of upwards wellness. Great, thank you. And you spoke about this a little bit at the end of your speech, but how can scientists and social workers specifically come together to fight the impact climate change has on mental health? It's a very exciting time to be a social worker or a mental health professional of any kind because people are now professionally, collectively organizing around this. So I mentioned the Climate Psychology Alliance, there's the Climate Psychiatry Alliance. There are social workers who I've seen who are writing articles about this saying we need to band together and see that we need to reorient ourselves towards serving the mental health fallout from the climate change is our number one priority. And that's creating a new ethos and a new collective will and hope within these communities that are so impactful right now. So I would just say, please go out there, Google these alliances I've talked about. First, um, Climate Psychiatry and Psychology Alliances, they have so many resources and links about places you can go further if you're looking to bring that into your professional practice. Great, thank you so much. I think that's a great note to end on. So thank okay. you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so now that we know that uh, climate change can affect mental health, what exactly goes on in our brains when we make decisions during a crisis? Our friends from MINDS, a student-led neuroscience outreach group at Mount Sinai, will walk us through this. 